Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Well, well you still deciding? Uh, hey, would y'all give them a, a big hand? Amen. You know, I've told you over the last couple of weeks in this transition time of, of raising up new worship leaders and raising up new leaders, uh, some weeks we're going to come in here and we're going to do pre-rapture practice and we're going to jump and we're going to think, hey, this is the greatest thing ever. And then other weeks we're letting people learn. Amen. And to, to today, um, wow, da, 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 uh, <laughs> almost, uh, to get some Baptists worried in here this morning, scared I'm going to speak in tongues. Um, uh, <laughs> anyway... Um, I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, it's hard some days. And, and we had some of our key guys missing this morning. And so I just so appreciate Danielle and the team being up here and uh, continuing to work and continuing to be a part of this. And so here's what we can do for our team when they're up here leading. Y'all ready? I mean, yeah, give them a hand. That's okay. Uh, let, let, me, let me teach you just for a minute, then we're going to get into our series. Um, Here's what we can do for these guys up here, especially when sometimes they stumble and sometimes they have a song, is for us to sing at them. Sing with them. Okay, because I'm telling you, it, nothing's more encouraging. I've, I've preached and y'all have been totally silent for a whole hour before. And I just want to go home and like, oh my gosh, I'm quitting. I'm resigning tomorrow, you know. And uh, Because when there's total silence and no response, it's hard. And same thing with leading worship is that we want to sing back at them, okay? And so we're singing to the Father, but we're also encouraging them. And part of worship is not only singing to God, but we're encouraging each other, Amen. Okay, so uh, I appreciate these guys so much and what God's doing in them. Now, if you've not been here in a while, we're in the middle of a series uh, called WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? And last week we ended and we changed it, Who Would Jesus Diss? <laughs> Who Would Jesus Diss? You see, what I've loved about this summer, and I know for some of us in here, um, this has been a challenging summer for some of us. But what I love about these series of messages, it's really about our posture that we take towards sinners, not so much the position we hold. It's really about the posture we have towards sinners. And this whole m series of messages is about our, our, our posture, not so much our theology. Now, we want to learn good theology, and we want to have good theology because it matters. Remember, we said that our theology is like our bones, and, and our posture and the way we love each other and the way we love people is kind of the muscle around those bones. And so theology matters, but I think at the same time, we may have great theology, but have terrible posture in the way we respond to people. One of the things I know about Jesus, in fact, I was even studying this last week more and more, is that his posture was never one of judgmental. His posture was never one of judgmental towards those outside the faith. It was always grace and truth. In fact, Jesus' harshest words, his harshest judgment was towards the religious if you go back and you look at this New Testament, Jesus' harshest words were those on the inside, not those on the outside. And that ought to make us stop. I know for some of us in here, and maybe you're listening online and you've never heard things like this talked about on the stage and it stressed you. Because we've had long held positions that need to be challenged and brought in view of what scripture says and not let tradition or culture affect us 
or determine our beliefs. And the beauty of teaching these messages is that we would look, start looking at our posture. How do we respond to people? And that examination is to affirm and to confirm our position as lining up with Scripture, not that tradition and culture are determining what we believe. And as serious Bible people, we need to make sure our lenses are not clouded by culture or tradition or long-held family beliefs. And I know some of the topics we've taken up this summer, they're not mission critical to the gospel. They're not going to uh, determine whether or not you go to heaven or hell. Only Jesus does that. Can I just say that? Amen. And in some of these things we've talked about this summer, we can agree to disagree on. Amen? But it does affect our commandment to win the lost and disciple the saints. Because even if we hold the right position, if our posture is not in line with our scripture and what Jesus says, then it affects how we disciple. And at some point, we ended last week, we've arrived and come to the belief that we're to boycott, to diss, to withdraw from anyone and isolate from them. If they're sinners and those who sin, and somewhere along the way, we've even categorized sin as we said last week, I don't think that was Jesus' strategy. I, in fact, I can't find anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus boycotted any of the businesses that were going on there in Jerusalem. Amen? I don't see it. <laughs> so we ended last week in 1 Corinthians 5. I want to look at it again. I want you to see it. Here's what Paul said. I wrote to you in my letter. Not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. Don't even eat with such people. And for many of us, when we read that, and especially in our culture we're in, We've equated sexual sin and homosexuality as the ultimate unpardonable sin elevated to a greater place than all other sins. We have elevated, we, we, we've baptized the rest of those, but we've elevated this thing of sexual sin. And I will agree that the sexual sin has a greater earthly consequence for many reasons. But in God's eyes, it's the same. Sin, death, and separation. But we have categorized it. And the very reason Christ died on the cross is sin, death, separation, and brokenness. In fact, in 2009, the Barna Research Group published a book called Unchristian. Anybody ever read that book or looked at that book in the room? Anybody? It's interesting because he found that unchurched people ages 16 to 35 were asked what they thought of Christians. And here's what they, they said. They thought that Christians were unchristian. Now, isn't that odd? What do you think of uh, Christians? Oh, I think they're unchristian. It's just kind of weird, isn't it? And when it comes to the reason why they thought that the church or Christians were unchristian is because at the top of their list from ages 16 to 35, they believe the church is anti-gay. Now think about this for a minute. The most common thing any non-church person in the age group from 16 to 35 thinks about Christians is that we're anti-gay. How'd this happen? How did it come to the place that the very reputation of us, Christ-like followers, somehow gets tied into what we think about and how we treat gay people? I know some of you are way uncomfortable right now. I wish you could see your faces. <laughs> you see, here's the sad thing. While we've been arguing theology in the church and yelling at each other on Facebook, Our whole public identity has been refashioned. And the lost world is honestly looking at us and going, I don't want anything to do with them. I don't know how this happened, but my guess is it's what Jesus warned us about in Luke chapter 6. Look at it. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus warned us, do not judge or you'll, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And I believe a lot of our judgmentalism has come back to bite us. So what do we do? We've judged. 
And we've held a community of believers or a community of people who claim to be gay or claim to be LBGT. And we've isolated them and we've judged them. And now all of a sudden we're being judged back. Ed Stetzer, Southern Baptist missionologist, noticed based on the church treatment of the homosexual community, there will be more and more people unwilling to give Christians or churches a hearing. He goes on to say, this means that unless we fundamentally change the way we relate to the homosexual community, we run the risk of alienating not only the gay community, but the larger cultural audience, all on our inability to love. <laughs> and this ought to put all of our arguing and fighting in perspective. Because the way we have and are going about this can rightly be called a, a, a false witness to the gospel. The gospel is good news. Do you know that? Do, do you believe that the gospel is good news? Well, guess what? If we're going to share the good news, then we've got to love the people we want to share with them. You see, theology and witness are tied together. This is one of the reasons why we're seeing more and more younger Christians, millennials, embracing a gay affirming theology once they leave the nest and head off to college. And very honestly, it's not necessarily because they're convinced about the biblical arguments of it. It's just very simply, it's because it feels more loving response and they think we're mean. <laughs> and we are. And for many in the younger generation, it's not just about correct doctrine as it is about correct loving. And the traditional side seems harsh and judgmental and bigoted because we baptize all the other sins of greed and slandering and, and idolatry and all those others, that's okay, right? And yet we haven't baptized this one. Can I just tell you this? If Jesus died for those, he died for this one. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we're to love those people. So millennials and young Christians are going to college. In fact, I was reading a, a book this last week that a lot that's going on in the gay community is that the church should be the safest place on earth and it's not anymore. And so what they're doing is they're running to a safe place so they can work out their identity. And yet, shouldn't this be the safest place on earth for people to come and work out their identity in Christ, not in culture, but in Christ? And yet they're running to that community because it's the only place they feel loved. And these young kids are leaving and going to college and they're going, man, that looks a whole lot more inviting than the judgmental, judgmental place that I just left. See, when it comes to these sorts of issues, I find that Christians on the traditional side of things tend to, to lead, relationally speaking, from a theological position, often making it hard to embrace the person Remember the old slogan, love the sinner, hate the sin? Remember that? How many of you agree with that? So here's the problem. Very few in the church ever got around to loving the sinner. Very few of us ever got around to loving the sinner. And so the church culture at large says, oh, we love the sinner, but we hate the sin. No, we just hate sin. And we should. Okay, now listen to me. This is where a lot of the tension is coming in for us. We should hate sin. Sin destroys. Sin kills. Amen? Now listen to me. we got to love the sinner. Your theology and your practice goes together. And somewhere along the line, we separated that. One of the most holy things that we can do is love sinners. But when we lead with our theology, we tend to get caught up in the wrongness of someone's behavior. And we lose the humanness of that person is lost. And they need Jesus. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Edward, if we embrace someone, are we condoning their lifestyles? Right? Well, if I embrace them, am I condoning their lifestyles? It's a great question. So let me answer it with Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this when? While we were still sinning. While we were still sinning, what did Jesus do? Christ died for you. Now, isn't that amazing? Isn't that absolutely amazing? <laughs> that Christ's example, he not only embraced us, he died for us before we were ever acknowledged or accepted him. That's crazy right there. 
That's crazy talk, isn't it? (laughs) Jesus didn't wait for us to get our behaviors cleaned up before he embraced us. He embraced us first. He came to us first. And working this out relationally with people is, I know, complex. But it's essential with those folks in our community that are struggling with their sexual identity, that there is a great chance that some of you in this room are struggling with your sexual identity. How do we respond to them? Well, one of the things we can't do is we don't close the relational door. We cannot close the relational door. And that's one of the biggest issues facing of how I grew up. I grew up very traditional, very conservative. And listen, when it comes to Jesus, I'm still conservative. But listen to me, we would not even have conversations. We we jumped on the Disney boycott. We jumped on the Target boycott. We jumped on all of that. Remember that? Oh, that that was last year. I'm sorry. (laughs) And somewhere along the way, we quit having conversations with sinners. (laughs) We formulated our theological position devoid of any real contact or context of the very people it's been formulated about. We have all these ideas, but yet we've never interacted with any of the people that we call sinners. And that's not how theology is supposed to work. See, theology should be worked out in the robustness of human relationships with all the love and pain and angst that accompanies them. Radical engagement and loving of the other earns us the right to even speak to them. Many of us want to speak to them outside of any context of relationship. That's why we post the stuff we post on Facebook. Well, I'll show them. I'll jump on that one. Out of any context, we feel, I think when it comes to our theology, we need to feel it, not just think about it. Somebody wrote, Theology that is pre-pain must be treated with suspicion. Theology that is pre-pain must be treated with suspicion. In other words, let our theology get under our skin. Think about it. How it must feel for those about whom we're developing it. It isn't even enough to have correct theology anymore. It never was. It's about getting to the sincere relational love, the center. Yes, we should have good theology, but love God, theology, love people, relationships. They go together. They don't separate. Somewhere we separated that. Of all places, our church should be a safe refuge because we actually say that we believe in a loving king, that he loves us, and this should be the safest place. If we believe that restored, redeemed, new life is found in Jesus, this ought to be the safest place for anybody to come and work out their stuff. Amen? Amen? You see, we confess that we are all sinners, that we need grace. No one can out the grace of God. And we know that obedience leads to blessing always. Don't miss that statement. Obedience leads to blessing always. But listen, if we're going to present Christ to people, then we must be willing to pour love on those people who still may be sinning. And by the way, who are we kidding? We're all still sinning. Amen? There's not a one in here that's not still sinning. And you may be having a good day. Or at least you were before you got here, right? We're all sinners, man. And yet we will self-righteously judge those whose temptation is different from ours. I mean, who's going to cast the first stone? Yeah, but Edward, if we embrace someone, we're condoning their lifestyle. I hear you, baby. (laughs) Can I just say this about this whole condoning? Jesus didn't worry about what religious people thought when he went to the tax collector's house and had dinner with them. He just went and had fun. He enjoyed dinner with Zacchaeus. Do you understand that? And see, we've, we've, re- we've taken Zacchaeus and we've made him this religious giant. He was not. He was a midget who was a sinner. Amen? I can't believe I just said midget from the stage, but <laughs> probably need to edit that. But um, Zacchaeus was a sinner. 
Jesus wasn't worried about what religious people thought. See, I think we have to show people Jesus and, and how to follow him. Association does not equal affirmation. Association does not equal affirmation. I would pray we all be accused like Jesus of being a friend of sinners. Jesus didn't worry about that his unconditional love might confuse people into thinking he approved of their sin. In fact, there's three examples when I look in scripture, three stories of Jesus interacting with someone. In fact, I wanna look at those today because they're scandalous. It's three women. Jesus was talking to a woman of a different race, living with a man. After being married five times, we see Jesus talking and interacting with a woman caught in the act of having sex with a man. Okay, yep, it's on now. And you know, it's just one of those mornings, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's just uh, the enemy it sometimes works and sometimes it's just us messing up, amen. Um, then the third one, we see Jesus interacting with a prostitute. And I wanna look at these four, these three examples and then I wanna close with a couple of things that Jesus said this morning and may it challenge us. The first one's found in John chapter four. He met a woman at a well about noon and his disciples had gone into town. Jesus was alone with her, which is scandalous in the first place. And she came along at an odd time, so you could suspect in that day, if she wasn't there with all the other women, something was up. And then John chapter 4, can you turn me down just a little bit, Derek? Um, John chapter 4, verse 9, says, A Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For us Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, she was a different race and a woman. Don't let that pass you by. That may not mean anything to us today, but in Jesus' day, women did not associate with Jewish men. Jewish men didn't associate with single women, especially of another race. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now I want you to notice what Jesus did. Jesus offered her living water. He offered her the gospel first. He said, you want to you know what satisfies? I'm the one that satisfies. And if you want that, I'll give it to you. And the woman said to him in verse 25, this is interesting, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one, am speaking to you. I am here. Now, I want you to notice in this passage, you can go back and read this fully later today maybe. Jesus did not once convince her that living with a man unmarried is sinful. Did you notice that? Look at the grace involved here. Because see, that's where most of us would go first, Right? He didn't demand that she kick the man out. He simply offered himself to her as the savior of the world, the Messiah, who could give her living water. And you know what she did? She took him up on his offer. And this is crazy. She went back to town. And notice this, she went back to town and immediately kicked the man out of her house. No. If you read on in that passage, she goes back to town, tells everybody she's met the Messiah, brings them all out to meet Jesus and becomes the very first missionary of Jesus Christ to introduce people to him and yet she's still living with the man. That's scandalous. That bothers me. Can I just be that honest? That, that bothers me. Jesus didn't do it the way I think he should do it. Now come on, you can laugh about that, right? Right? Because this is where we get all kind of twisted off. Jesus here just said, basically says to her, listen, lady, I'm the one that'll give you life. Now, we can assume she went on to lead a life, and that's where we get in trouble is when we start assuming, don't we? Because then we'll go into that, and we'll start building her whole life. I had an assembly of God pastor tell me years ago, Jesus is so much better at conforming men to his image than I am conforming them to mine. Amen? Here's the second story. In John chapter 8, Jesus comes upon a woman who was about to be stoned. Y'all remember that story? Teachers of the law caught her in adultery. They drug her out into the street. We don't know if she was naked. We don't know if she was covered. 
We don't have a lot of details around that. We don't know if they went and caught there in the actual act. And sometimes we'll describe that, well, they were looking through the window and all that. We don't know all that. We just know that the woman was having an adulterous affair and they drug her out. And in that day, the law of Moses says, if you're caught in in an affair, that you are to stone the woman. Don't worry about the man. Tell me how twisted that is. Stone the woman. So Jesus is in the middle of that. And the religious Pharisees tried to trap him. Isn't that amazing? And we think we're unique in our arguments. In Jesus' day, the religious were trying to trap him. And Jesus' response provides an incredible model for those of us talking with those guilty of sexual sin. And Jesus says two things to the woman. Many of us only remember one or the other. In John chapter 8, 6 through 11, listen to it. But Jesus bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Boy, don't you wish we knew what he was writing. Mm. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up, and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. And Jesus straightened up, and he asked her, Woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. No one. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go now and leave your life of sin. It's amazing. Is that Jesus defended this woman against those that wanted to condemn her? Could it be? It's just a thought. Could our churches... Could our church, could this church see ourselves as a defender of sinners? It's just a thought. You see, Jesus led the men to confess, to look at themselves before throwing a stone. And then he said to the woman, as he led with grace, I don't condemn you either. I don't condemn you either. And then he said this, you see, the heart of grace and the gospel is that God forgives guilty people, and we should too, amen? But then he said this, and this is so powerful, because Jesus led with grace, and he ended with truth. Again, he said, go now and leave your life of sin. Leave it. He pointed her in the direction of wholeness and holiness built on a foundation of grace, not judgmentalism. Could we be people who drop our stones of judgment? Could we be people who point to holiness without condemnation and judgment? I would say yes. And I pray that we would all become more like Jesus and stop condemning the already condemned, amen? They know they're condemned. People that are living with people and people that are sinning, they already know they're struggling if they have a relationship with Jesus, amen? So why should we condemn them? Let's love them. Like Jesus, can we stand up for sinners against their accusers to gently and humbly resist condemning people, even those in open sin, as we call them to leave their sin behind? You see, Jesus gives us an example of how to handle this. Let's look at one more, the prostitute. In Luke chapter 7, he was at a party. Jesus found himself at a party a lot of times, didn't he? I think people love to be around him, but anyway, well, that's a whole other sermon. And he was at this party, and it's at Simon's house, and uh, it was, they were going on there, and, 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 and there was this woman there washing his feet with, his, with her tears. And if that's not scandalous enough, she then let her hair down. And she poured perfume on him, and she was rubbing her hair on Jesus. Come on. Is that not weird to anybody in the room? Has that happened last night for anybody? <laughs> and by the way, sometimes I think we read scripture and we read it. Oh, yeah, the prostitute was what and that's just what did. Sometimes that's weird, amen? And we never acknowledge the weirdness of scripture. And so if you're lost in the room this morning going, yep, that, 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 that's weird. You see, the gospel writer here in this story describes her as a woman who lived a sinful life, and many believe she was a prostitute. How did Jesus treat her? Look at it. 
In Luke chapter 7, verse 36, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume, and she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears, and then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, I love it. Simon, I have a story to tell you. You can just hear Simon, okay, yes, Lord, yes, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. He said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Jesus said, you've judged correctly, son. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't even give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour oil on my head. She has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven loves little. Or excuse me, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this? who even forgives sins. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now here's what's interesting about this story. Jesus knew the woman had many sins. And it's what's interesting is the story does not tell us that she was still involved in prostitution, that she was still involved in, in her sinful lifestyle. We just know that she was a sinful woman. And the, Jesus didn't quote her to the law. He didn't tell her to stop it. Jesus didn't tell her to stop touching him. He let her touch him. When Jesus approached a woman with those sins, the story does not show where Jesus judged her. He didn't immediately point out, why are you touching me? Let me stand a little arm's length from you, right? Because I don't want what you got jumping out on me. You see, what Jesus approached her with was lavish forgiveness. Lavish forgiveness. Because all she could do is pour her tears and just to be close to him. Now, can you imagine that our church would be known as a place of safety and grace? What would that look like? What would it look like for this place to be known in this community and on TV and on Facebook and on Vimeo and on YouTube and all the different avenues of people that listen to us? What if they found that this was the safest place on earth for grace? You see, Jesus did not say that we would know his disciples by our moral stance on social issues. Jesus said that you will know that they are my disciples by how they what? Love one another. Love one another. See, I think God wants the church to be a place where struggling people find hope and find healing. People rejected as sinners by other religious people flock to Jesus. When the religious crowds wouldn't have anything to do with the tax collectors, wouldn't have anything to do with prostitutes, you know where they went? To Jesus. It's stunning to me. How the church, and I don't mean us, I mean the church universal has become a place of such division and arguments over theology and we have forgotten the mission that God died for the broken so that you and I may repent and believe and lead others to repentance and believe in the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he died for our sin and so that we could win others to Jesus. Amen? And somewhere along the way, we have just gotten to be arguing with each other. I was reading about Beth Moore last night on Twitter and how the whole religious right has turned against this one lady. And I don't have to agree with everything Beth Moore says. And very honestly, I don't agree with everything you say any more than you believe everything I say. Amen? 
But when did the church turn on each other in the name of social justice or being right? Something's wrong. I mean, what if gay people, sexual sinners, swindlers, thieves, drug addicts, sinners, were drawn to our church, a place of grace and truth, where they can work out their identity, where they can, they can begin to find places of brokenness, be healed in submission to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. Where we would be that kind of place and say, in Jesus' name, you're forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, too many Christians have strong convictions but embarrass Jesus by how we relate to people. I mean, there's some people I listen to that I love their theology. They're just not very fun to be around. They're mean. Amen? And I don't know about you. I don't want to hang out with mean people. One of my best friends, man, leads a seminary over in Africa. I love him, but sometimes it's not fun. Amen? We embarrass. Then we have other Christians who are so incredibly civil and yet have no theological backbone. And so somewhere in the middle, we've got to become 100% truth and 100% grace and not watering down one or the other. Not 50-50. Be full of grace and full of truth. Jesus modeled that for us because we're all broken and need a Savior. We're all in the now and the not yet. You see, somewhere along the way, We're still working through this brokenness to work out our salvation, to work it out. And so if someone has identity issues and sexual identity issues, let's let them work it out. Let's let them work it out at the foot of the cross and not hurl insults at them, not hurl judgments at them, but to walk with them, to walk with them. To have a conversation with them, not with the idea to fix them, but to lead them to the foot of the cross where you and I should be. Not in judgment, but in grace. So let me close with two statements from our first story where Jesus was writing in the sand. And Jesus said, Are you going to cast the first stone? And the story goes that those men dropped. And I think it's something that every one of us as we walk out of here today should be answering. Are we willing to drop our stones? You see, for you, it may not be the sexual sin that's your big issue. It may be alcohol. It may be tattoos. It may be something we haven't talked about. Are you willing to drop your stones? Just drop them. And then look what Jesus said. Remember this? See, this is all of us in here. He looked at the woman. He said, I don't condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. And by the way, this is you in here. This is, this is us, church. There is no condemnation in Christ. There is no condemnation in Christ. He's not holding out, waiting for you to mess up so he can stone you. Did you hear that? He's not holding a stone waiting for you. John, just mess up. I'm fixing to throw it at you. Just, just come on. There's therefore no condemnation in Christ. And so, what would it look like for you and I to just lay them down? Just lay them down. One of the biggest reasons I got off Facebook, one is for my health. But two, it may be the reason I get off Twitter eventually is how mean Christians are to each other. And it's no wonder the world out there, it's no wonder that our kids are growing up and they're going to college and some liberal professor starts talking about love, accepting everybody. And they come home and we wonder what's happened to our kids because we taught them good theology, but we didn't teach them how to love each other because we're too busy casting stones. And we'll get on Facebook and we'll like that And we'll send that picture to our gay cousin or our gay friend 
thinking, well, this, the cross of Jesus, a minister to them. Can I just tell you this? The reason it doesn't minister to them is because we have not loved them. And so the cross to them doesn't mean anything. The cross to them doesn't mean anything. What they need is for you to go sit down and have a cup of coffee with them and hear their story. It's what anybody needs. I don't want somebody lobbing stones at me, amen? And I get it every week. Listen, your embrace, when we lead with forgiveness, dealing with our sons and our daughters and our sisters and our brothers and our nephews and our cousins, our uncles and aunts, our coworkers, our friends, when we lead with forgiveness, that embrace will give you more platform to live out your good news and speak the truth than any other Facebook post or any other comment that we would lead with forgiveness. Take the very example of Jesus Christ, but God demonstrated his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning with all the quirks and all the sound stuff and all the music and just all the stuff that's going on. Your word says that we're to be grateful. And very honest, Lord, I'm frustrated this morning. I feel like that. The enemy's just at work to divide us, the destruction. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus right now that every man and woman in this room that wants to cast the first stone would just drop them. For marriages in this room that, Lord, they've been stoning each other for the last six years, three years, six months. God, would you step in the middle of that? Father, for those of us in this room that they're just struggling with even that we would talk about this on Sunday morning. Father, I pray that the enemy wouldn't have a place to come in and divide. That the most holy thing we could do is love each other the way you've loved us. Father, I know there's some folks in this room that they have brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, co-workers, children that are struggling with sexual sin and struggling with sexual identity. Well, Father, would you give grace? Help us love. Help us demonstrate your kindness and your grace by the way we speak to them and embrace them and love them. Oh, Father, forgive us. Father, forgive us. Father, forgive us. And I pray, Lord, that this would be the safest place on earth for people to work out their identity in Jesus Christ with a group of people that are just going to walk with you and point towards holiness and point towards healthiness, not with judgment and condemnation, but with all the grace and the truth that you came to us with. Father, forgive us for being mean, judgmental, we need you. Holy Spirit, fill us. Father, for the ones that's lost loved ones, for Kay this morning, Lord, I pray that you would just minister to her. She lost her mama last night. Father, for Father, minister to her today. For Catherine that lost her daddy this week. And Father, I know there's, there's some I don't even know about that are hurting in this room, not because of death, but just because life stinks. Father, would you minister to them? 
Father, forgive us. May we approach people with the embrace of love and forgiveness and not judgment and condemnation. Oh, Father, forgive us. I love you. We ask this in Jesus, that beautiful name, Jesus. And everybody said? Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.